chapter 24, if you'll open there, please. Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And when they found the stone rolled away from the and, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling apparel. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. In 1 John chapter 1, John also alludes to the fact of Jesus' resurrection. And he alludes to his experience and the experience of the other apostles who met them after the event that we just read. We read of the women, they come to the tomb, and they find that it's empty. They expected to find a body. They expected to find his body. They expected to honor him and burying his body with spices, but there is no body there. And after that event, when they found an empty tomb, Jesus appeared to the women, appeared to his apostles, appeared to them over the course of some 40 days. And John, reflecting back on that experience, says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was from the beginning... What we have heard, listen, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. When was it manifested? When the tomb was empty and when he was found to be alive. And the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And what we have seen and what we have heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be complete. What does it mean? What does it mean that the tomb was empty? What does it mean that John and the other apostles, that they touched the hands of Jesus after he was dead and he was raised? What does it mean that they saw the scar in his side and that they saw the holes in his hands and how they'd healed? What does, it, what does it mean that for 40 days they talked with him and they ate with him and they walked with him after he had died and was now alive again? Why does it matter that the tomb was empty? What does it mean? There, there are a lot of ways we could answer that question, but the way that I want us to answer that today is I want us to look at some of the things that the apostles themselves said about the significance of the fact that the tomb was empty. What did they say about what, the, what this means? What, what is the meaning of this? Look, look, if you would, first with me at Acts chapter 3 and verse 13. Acts chapter 3 and verse 13. Just a few days, just a few weeks after the event that we read in Luke chapter 24, Peter and John were in the temple and they had healed a man that was lame, and they had an opportunity to explain to the people how the man had been made well. And they connected it to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead and gave meaning to that. And so look, if you would, at Acts chapter 3 and verse 13, 
when, uh, when Peter says the following. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. He has glorified the one whom you delivered up and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned, listen, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are all witnesses. The the first thing that I want you to see that the resurrection means is that he is holy. It means that he is holy. It proves what Peter just has asserted before the people, that Jesus was a holy and a righteous one. They took him who was holy and righteous and they put him to death and they asked for a murderer to be released, but God vindicated the character of Jesus. He showed that he was in fact one that was innocent, one who was holy and one who was righteous. And they put the holy and righteous one to death, but God raised him up and proved that he was the prince of life, that he was a virtuous man. Now, there have been lots of people through the ages that have innocents that have died, people that didn't deserve to die when they did or how they did or for the reason that they did. But, but I want you to see something that is very unique about Jesus, and that's the fact that he was not just innocent of the crime for which he was accused. He was not just, he, he, just, he was not just too young. It's the fact that he was guilty of no crime. It's the fact that he was completely innocent. It's the fact that he, was, he grew to be an accountable man and, and he had immense trials and yet he never forsook God. He never did wrong. He was as holy as God. He was completely righteous. He was completely virtuous. And the way that I know that is because God raised him from the dead. He proved that he didn't deserve to die. He deserved to live and he deserved to live forever because he was so holy and so virtuous and so righteous. And so the proof that we have of the character of Jesus is bound up in the fact that that God vindicated his character by raising him from the dead. Death, it, it says in another passage, could have no power over him. We, um, you know, there, there's not a way that you can prove the connection between death and sin. I mean, in a, in a scientific way. But, 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 but the thing that Jesus' resurrection proves is that death is not a, it's not a medical problem. It's a moral problem. Our experience of death, the fact that we experience corruption, the fact that we experience death is, 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 not, is not tied to something Physical. I mean, there are physical things that happen, but it is, it is in the end. It is in the beginning. It is a moral problem, not a medical one. And Jesus' resurrection is the proof of that. When an innocent man died, God raised him from the dead because death can't have power over an innocent one. It can't have power over a holy and a virtuous one. And so Jesus' death and his resurrection is proof of his holiness. That's part of what it means. It means more than that though, however. Look if you would at chapter 5 of Acts. Acts chapter 5. And we find that it has even more meaning from another message that was preached by uh, the apostles. And so in chapter 5 and in verse 30, uh, Peter says this as he's meeting to a group, as he's speaking to a group of Jewish leadership, he says, excuse me, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Jesus' holiness has further implications. 
it doesn't just mean that he is innocent and he is virtuous, that he is equal to God in terms of his moral character. But, but that has implications for us because of the fact that he is holy, because he is virtuous, because he is innocent. Then, then that, that gives him the right to be something on our behalf. And what, what Peter is explaining to the leadership here is that that gives him the right, God has exalted him to his right hand so that he can be a prince and a savior. His holiness means that his death was effective for someone else. He didn't die for his sins. He died for our sins. He was proven to be the lamb that was worthy to take away sins. He was proven to be God's answer to the problem of our sin, of our separation from God. And so because of his holiness, because of his virtue, then then we find that he is sufficient, that he is the answer, that God looked at the gift of his life and it satisfied his holy wrath. It satisfied the the, the problem of separation between us and God. It, It satisfied the need that we had for someone to be our lamb, for someone to be our priest, for someone to be our savior. And when I, the way that I know that that happened is the resurrection. The resurrection is the proof that God approved of his sacrifice. It's the proof that, his, that the cup, that, 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 that the blood that's in the cup, that it, that it put in place a new covenant. And so I know that because of the resurrection. The resurrection means that Jesus is holy It means that Jesus is sufficient to be our sacrifice and to be our priest, to be our Savior, as Peter said it so succinctly. It means something more, though, than even those two things. Look, if you would, at Acts chapter 13 in another lesson that was preached by the apostles about the significance of Jesus' resurrection. This time, Paul is the one who is is speaking, and he says... In verse 29 of Acts chapter 13, And when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. Verse 30, But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now witnesses to the people. And we preach to you, the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this uh, promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm, verse 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, that is through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. The the point that Paul is making here in terms of what the resurrection means, what the resurrection proves, is that it absolutely proves and validates that God is faithful. It proves the faithfulness of God. He's saying that what happened with the death of Jesus and what happened with the resurrection of Jesus is is God doing what God said he would do. God, long time ago, made a promise to Abraham. And he took that promise and he made it again to Isaac. And he made that promise again to Jacob. And he says, now we, now our children, are seeing God fulfill his promise He made a promise 1,500 years ago through Moses. He made a promise 2,000 years ago to Abraham. And God is keeping his promise. And you know what? We did nothing to deserve that. We broke our promises. We broke our covenant. But God kept his promises. He's been faithful all along the way in spite of our faithlessness. And so the resurrection is proof that God is faithful. When God says he's going to do something, God does it every time. And he's done it in Jesus. He's, risen him, he's, ra- he's raised him from the dead. And all the things that we could not be freed from, that we could not be liberated from when we lived under law, we are free now. We are liberated now. Because God has shown himself to be faithful. The resurrection 
is proof of his faithfulness. It means something more than that. Look at Acts chapter 2. In the very first sermon that was ever preached after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, Peter explained in part the significance of that news to people. He says in verse 32 of Acts chapter 2, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. The good news of Jesus' resurrection, and, and what the resurrection proves, is that Jesus reigns. It was the path to His ascent to power. The, the resurrection was, was the gateway for Him to move into glory so that He could be an exalted Lord, so that God could glorify Him as a king. And the, the thing that Peter is proclaiming to the people on the day of Pentecost is that we, we were looking for a David and God did better than a David. He gave us a Jesus and he is reigning not here in Jerusalem. I don't care if the Romans are in power. I don't care that Caesar sits on the throne. Jesus is the one who rules. He's the one who's in charge. And it has ever been so since then. He reigns right now. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who's seated in Congress. It doesn't matter what world powers are present. It doesn't matter what armies there are. Jesus reigns. He is the king and there is no other. Isn't that great news? And the resurrection is the way that I know that that news is real. Just as Peter said on that first day, Jesus reigns and the resurrection is proof. Acts chapter 3, Peter says something else about that news that is uh, implied in his statement. He says in verse 26, as he's bringing his sermon to a close, he says, for you first, he's talking to Jewish people here. He said, for you, you first, God raised up his servant and send him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. The resurrection proves that Jesus was God's servant. But the resurrection means something more than the fact that he was just God's servant. It means that he's our servant. He said God raised him up again so that, he could, so that Jesus could come back to you. So that he could be sent to you. So that he could bless you by turning you from the way that you're living now to a better way. To turn you from your wicked ways so that you, could, you can be servants of God the way that He was. And he, he came to do that to bless not just the Jews in that regard, He came to bless all people in that way. Look at Acts chapter 10 when Peter is speaking to Cornelius' house. He says essentially the same thing to Cornelius. Acts 10 and verse 39 uh, Peter says here, And we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But he says, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us. To those of us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. You see, he's saying the same things that John said over in 1 John about our hands handled and we touched and we experienced him alive. He says, we've eaten with him, we've drank with him since coming back from the dead. And this is what that means. He ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who's been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. I tell you what the resurrection means, folks. It means that he loves us. It means that he cares. He really cares. And it means that I have tangible, visible proof of that, proof that was tested, proof that was tasted, proof that was felt, proof that was experienced, that He really does love me. And the way that I know that He loves me is because God has risen Him, risen him from the dead so that He can bless me. 
He sent Him to me. He did it through these witnesses so that we could know of His great love. And the resurrection is part of His proof that He loves us that much. Because He wanted us to know that there's hope. He wanted us to know that there was victory. He wanted us to know that He is a Savior. He wanted us to know about life. He wanted us to, be, to have proclaimed to us that eternal life which is in the Father and in the Son, the way that John wrote, so that our joy and their joy could be full in Him. He wants us to know of His love. The resurrection is proof of that. The resurrection means something more that is in some ways the sum of all the things that we've said. Look at Acts chapter 17. Another sermon, this time preached by Paul, explaining the significance of a resurrection to the people that didn't even, they've never heard of Jesus. Paul is standing on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, a great sermon, says beginning in verse 22, Men of Athens, I observe that you're very religious in all respects. As I was walking through your city, Paul said, I saw a, an altar that was built to an unknown God. Y'all are ignorant, is what he's saying. There's some things that you don't know about God. And I'm, I want to teach you. I want to share with you some things that I know. And I want you to see how Paul says that he knows these things. He says to them uh, in verse 29, Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. That's the ignorant part. We have, we've carved these images and we've called them gods. God, God isn't a rock. God isn't a tree. God isn't a nugget of gold even. God isn't, it doesn't matter how valuable it is from a material nature. That, that, that isn't God. God is like us, or, or better said, we are like Him. And so we ought not to think that God's nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the thought of man. Did we create God in our image? No, sir. Therefore, having overlooked these times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because He's fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He has appointed, having furnished proof to all men, not some men, having furnished proof to all men by raising Him from the dead. The resurrection proves this, folks. It proves there is a God. It proves that He is alive. It proves that He created. It proves that He is in charge. It proves that He lives. The resurrection is proof of that. How do I know there's a God? Folks met Him. They talked to Him. They ate with Him. They lived with Him. He, they killed Him and then He came back to life again. Just like He said He would do. And the resurrection is proof that He was not a man. That He is our God. The resurrection's proof of that. But it's more, it's more than just proof of his existence. Because the resurrection didn't just prove that he's alive. It, it proved to us the kind of God that he is. And so it's proof of his nature, just like it's proof of his existence. And what we learn in the resurrection about his nature is not just that there is a God, but that He is a holy God. How do I know the nature of God? I know the nature of God from the resurrection. I know that He's holy. Because He came and He lived as a man and He did it right. And He was selfless in that and He was humble in that and He was a servant in that. And so the resurrection is proof to me of the character of God. I know what His nature is like because it's been experienced among us. Uh, and I know not just that He's a holy God, but I know that He is sufficient for me. That He's sufficient to be my Savior. That, his, that He was sufficient to be a sacrifice. Who, that, that doesn't, that's mind-boggling. How, how could God give Himself for man? But God did that. And so God is not just holy, but God is sufficient to fill up everything that we lack, everything that we need, all of our deficiencies. We find our full supply in Him, and the resurrection is proof that He is all that I need. He's not just holy and He's sufficient, but He is a God who's faithful. 
The resurrection is proof that he is faithful, that he keeps his promises, that he always does the thing that he says he will do. The resurrection is proof that my God reigns. It's proof that he's in charge, that he is sovereign over history and over time, that he rules, that he always has and that he always will. The resurrection is my guarantee of that. The resurrection is proof to me that he loves. How do I know that? How do I know that he's holy? How do I know that he's sufficient? How do I know that he's faithful? How do I know that he reigns? How do I know that he loves? Because I know that he lives. And it, it, it's a guarantee of all of that. Because he lives, all of those things are true. All of those things are validated. All of them have his stamp of approval. Now, doesn't that change some things? Well, it just changes everything. It's the reason why it changed the fisherman. It's the reason why it changed the tax collector. It's the reason why it changed everyone whose life was touched by him meaningfully. It just changes everything. Uh, my faith the last little while has not been what it ought to be. I said to Jen this morning as I was thinking about the resurrection. Uh, I, I, I need uh, some maintenance time every day with me and God. That's, that's an that's a antiseptic word. Maintenance is the wrong word. But you, you under, I need some relationship time with God every day. And when, when my routine is good, when I start my day with God, when I get, I get up early... And the best thing for me to do when I get up early in the morning is to, is to have time that's just me and the Lord. Now, I need that because I found that when I don't have that, my heart is not good. It, it goes, I, I focus on the wrong things. I, I, my, I, I, get, I get bothered by the wrong things. I get distracted with the wrong things. My attitude is not good. My perspective is not good. And so I just, I have to confess to you that I'm weak that way. You all need to know that about me. I am not good when I don't have that kind of time. And I have not made that kind of time in the last six weeks or so. I've, I've started my day with work rather than starting my day with God. And the, the, the fallout of that is that, is that it, it's just made me, it's just, it's just affected my heart. My heart has not been good. I've just been... Uh, I've been discouraged at times, and I've been, uh, I've been distracted at times, and I've been, I've been bitter at times, and I've been short-tempered with Jennifer at times. And, and all of those things are the consequence of not having, of not making that kind of time. And the, the, the thing that I want to say to you is that that's a faith problem, because there, there, there hasn't been, these last few weeks, the confidence on my part that if I take care of the God stuff first, if I take care of my relationship with Him first, then everything else will work out. Well, the, the job will get done. The, the containers will get loaded. The furniture will be made. Uh, and, and, if it, and if it's not, then God will take care of that. If it doesn't all get done, it's okay. But the thing that has to matter first is, is me and my relationship with Him. And if I don't prioritize that, then I'm really, not, I'm really not walking, I'm not living the life that He intended me to live because He lives. I'm not living the resurrected life that He's called us to. Now I confess that because maybe there's... Well, I confess that because I need to. I, I, I need your help in that. I need to do better about that. I need the accountability of saying that that's not been right. And I need to do better. Maybe you need to do better too. And maybe, maybe there's some part of the resurrection and what that says about God and who He is and the fact that He lives and, and what we know about His nature. Maybe you need to bring some part of that to some area of your life so that the light of His living, the light of His resurrection brings about a good change in you. That's the point of it. That's the purpose of it. Is that what we know about Him changes the way that we behave and the way that we live because we know that He lives. 
Won't you commit your life to him this morning if you're not a follower of his? Won't you see that the tomb is empty? I've had a favorite expression in the last week or so that came from uh, the leadership class. Uh, We were talking about change and about when you make change, it needs to be on purpose. You don't just change things for change's sake. You change things so that... Because, because the, the, the change is going to lead us in, in a, to a better place, in a better direction. And Flynn had the best line for that. He says, you, you, the only reason you change something is because it's going to be more better. And that is exactly right. Jesus, Jesus was raised from the dead so that everything could be more better. And I am so grateful that it's all more better in Him. Why would, you, why would you settle for something that's less than more better when we can have the best that there is in Him? Won't you come and partake of that? It's together we stand and as we sing.